you so much. For, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I must say, you know, a lot of people on the call, maybe faculty and a definitely residents, um, make sure you do something that gives you joy. Um, I started DJ and I just have to say like after uh, residency, like as soon as I passed my boards, I started learning, I started to learn how to DJ. And I'm just saying that to say, just make sure you do something um, that not only is a passion, but also brings you joy. So please don't forget that if you've gotten any, you know, nothing else from uh, this talk. Okay, so let's get to it. Rounding Wild Black. We will be examining uh, the evidence of structural racism in everyday clinical practice. Okay, so I have no conflicts, uh, no financial conflicts or otherwise. And so our objectives for today, we will be defining rounding my black. We'll examine the early history of the US healthcare system and certain early health and public policies that are linked to the current health disparities that we see today. Uh, we will examine the unequal distribution of wealth healthcare access in communities in the US and the result of generational health inequity. We will also discuss the legacy of medical racism and medical mistrust that we encounter on rounds. And we will ask ourselves, are we coded for bias? We will also discuss the historical context of black physicians in the US and where we are today. And then after round, we will discuss a path forward. So historically speaking, in the last few years, uh, it has been noted that a person, uh, you know, could be exposed to, could lose their life, witness or suffer emotional trauma from uh, driving while Black, jogging while Black, sleeping while Black, shopping while Black, walking home while Black, bird watching while Black, home ownership while Black, and me, I am rounding while Black. These are the areas where I intersect. Uh, I identify as a woman, immigrant background, uh, and I am Black. And this is where I work. Uh, I really love where I work. Uh, it's a place in Atlanta, Georgia uh, called Grady Memorial Hospital. And many of our patients are the working poor, immigrant, unemployed or underemployed. And this creates a unique opportunity for us to care for them. Many of our patients don't have access to a primary care physician. Um, concerning Medicaid expansion, it is not expanded uh, in Georgia. And so for many patients um, who may not have uh, jobs that cover their health insurance, they're not able to obtain it on their own outside of being very poor and receiving Medicaid, uh, pregnant or young people, meaning uh, little kids. Um, and so many of our patients, the first doctor they've seen in many years is the ER physician. And after that, it is us, the hospitalists. And so the question is, you know, how much does the U.S. actually spend? As you can see here, if you look at the bottom left, uh, the tallest yellow bar is the U.S. We spend quite a bit um, concerning health care. And for those who have above average income, not as much. And then for those who are below average, quite a bit. And so the percentage of this population actually, you know, does not have health insurance and it's equal to what you would see in Cambodia or rural India. And access to a doctor is available in the US. However, um, you know, you can go to an emergency department. Um, if you want to, you can see a primary care physician or even have access to be referred to a consultant, but it will be out of pocket. Um, and you will be treated, you cannot be turned away because of MTELA, but uh, in the ED, but you will be billed. And so the US, uh, is a great place in that we do offer many preventative measures, breast cancer screening, pap smears, vaccinations, as you can see here, but we do lack equal uh, access to these health screenings uh, for many poor, white, Black, Latinx, uh, and Asian patients. And so U.S. hospitalizations have been some of the highest uh, in the past few years, but, you know, as we've noted, it has been high for quite some time. Um, and compared to our peers nationally, um, internationally, excuse me, we've been the highest um, in avoidable deaths. And so where does all this money go? And I'm going somewhere with this. You're asking why rounding wild black and why are we talking about this? Um, and so where does all this money go? Quite a bit of it uh, in the billions goes to hospital care. And you can see others, physician services, clinical service, services, prescription drugs, et cetera. But quite a bit of the money we spend in the US goes to hospital care. 
And COVID uh, gave a, or sent a significant blow to the US life expectancy. And those who were severely hit were Hispanic males and non-Hispanic black males. So they're dying earlier. So back to the question of Medicaid expansion, why is this somewhat important? As it's noted here in a few articles, Medicaid expansion associated with reductions in preventable hospitalizations. Um, and there's a racial divide in state Medicaid expansions. There are certain states that don't feel as comfortable because they feel certain groups may not be worthy. And it's not necessarily that state government, it's some of the attitudes that were pulled around it. And Medicaid expansion reduced uninsured surgical hospitalizations and associated catastrophic financial burden for many but you're not seeing this in many of these populations. And what you're finding in some of the states where uh, Medicaid is say not expanded and not to say this does not hit other states in the US, but you do find a high amount of a black population. So that's one part. And then two, given the history of the racial divide around the idea. And when I say Medicaid expansion, the whole idea is that I just equal access to preventative care is what we're talking about. And so I'm going to get a bit into the history of some of the things that have led to this, not necessarily just Medicaid expansion, but just a lot of the things that I encounter on rounds. And so when I knock on that door or pull back that curtain, I may see evidence of redlining, underfunded schools, the prison industrial complex, and a few other things. More of what I've encountered on rounds, structural racism, the medical education that many of us has received have been crafted off of the backs of the enslaved and disenfranchised historically. Job discrimination, uh, a term that is used, but not necessarily official, adultification of black children, racist algorithms, separate and unequal school systems, environmental racism, um, medical apartheid and the for-profit carceral state. And so let's get into it. This article here from the Washington Post notes that black men in DC are expected to die 17 years earlier than white men, and here's why. There's a young man named Samuel Mingle who's 55 and has grown up in Ward 8 in DC for quite some time. And the closest grocery store is a 30 minute walk away. He never knew that that was not the usual. He has type two diabetes and never questioned why he had to travel so far. And a couple of things I've highlighted in this article are that homicide has contributed to ages 15 to 39 concerning the life expectancy gap, but heart disease and cancer contributed uh, to ages 45 to 74. And then black women who have died 12 years or who are dying 12 years earlier than our white counterparts in 2016, heart disease, cancer, and perinatal conditions have contributed to this gap. So life expectancy and zip code, as noted by uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, this study showed uh, around the country areas where there was a huge life expectancy gap. And you might hear me say quite a bit about this because you know the, the proof is in the numbers. You're seeing stark contrast, such as those that are in Iberville, somewhere in between the French Quarter, Iberville in that area. And uh, 55 years of age is a life expectancy. But if you go to Navir or just between Navir and Lakewood in the top left, 80 years is the life expectancy. Why such a stark contrast? Well, historically, the Iberville projects were some of the last projects uh, built. Uh, and this is like subsidized government housing where uh, African-Americans were uh, basically And so this is one of the last projects that were created under the New Deal. Today, the average income yearly is about 19,000. And then in Navir, it's about 71,000. And so I live in Atlanta. And so I just wanted to show you some of the gaps where we are. So you might say, well, hey, Atlanta's not doing too bad. You know, some of the areas have a life expectancy of 71, 73, 74, 72. I live in the one center bottom, 30312, life expectancy, 74 years of age. But in Buckhead, which is a pretty uh, rich and famous area uh, in Atlanta, there's a 10-year difference just by zip code. 
There is a resident, uh, well, a former resident, now an attending, uh, who, when she was a medical student, went on a tour of a hospital to try to figure out if she wanted to, you know, train at that particular residency program. And she wanted to call something out, the pathology of racism. Um, and she said, we need to desegregate teaching hospitals. Why is this? Well, many of us who are part of vast hospital systems, such as Emory, within hospital medicine, we have 10 hospitals. <clears throat> some are teaching, some are not. Uh, we have 250 hospitals. It's pretty the largest academic hospitalist program. Uh, and we do teach residents as well. But the point is Emory has 10 hospitals, right? And so Grady is one of those that they say is a county, quote unquote, county hospital, hospital for indigent patients. But we have uh, some of the other uh, hospitals that are uh, not for necessarily the poor, those who have private insurance, uh, but also can be seen if they do not. Uh, but those are the hospitals that serve patients that are more well-to-do. And so the question uh, many of us ask uh, when we're at Grady versus may maybe other hospitals is what's the difference uh, outside of just our patients who may not be able to, you know, uh, be seen as quickly, who have long waits in the ED, et cetera, they come in so sick. What's the difference between our, our patients that are so sick at Grady per se versus maybe EUH, Emory University Hospital, which is uh, in the suburbs. So what's the difference? And why is it the norm for some people? They know that when they rotate, say they come to Grady Memorial Hospital, that they may have more autonomy, the patients will be sicker. And that's just something that's just understood. So this resident uh, had the same question, but a bit deeper. And so when she was on tour as a med student, um, you know, going through an ob gyn clinic, someone said to her uh, in the group, we have such advanced pathology here. And it was a promotion of, well, hey, we have some of the sickest cases or cases that you think you would see in some other country, but you see them here. And so her issue with that was, this idea of pathology that was a selling point from this tour guide was really an injustice because it was preventable cervical cancer, untreated abnormal uterine bleeding, absent prenatal care. And this basically happened mainly with patients who were black, Latinx, undocumented, poor rural, poor urban. And she thought that this should not be considered the norm, something that many of us consider baseline when we go to these teaching hospitals should not be the norm, it should not be accepted, and it's not a pathology that we should be excited about. Um, and so what she noted was that when she went to clinic, there was a clinic for residents and a clinic for the attending physicians, and the attending physicians saw the privately insured patients where the residents are the Medicaid patients or even uninsured. Our unconscious does lead us to believe that certain groups are inextricably linked to disease, meaning that there's a social reason for many of these um, conditions, i.e. addiction. However, we may think that because a certain group has been identified with say crack cocaine addiction, that it is criminal, it is something that is inherent with this group. However, today with the opioid crisis, we somewhat separated it and we're trying to take a look at it as if it's something psychological, that it is something that is also chemical. And we're trying to understand it as an actual condition outside of criminalizing it and also attaching it uh, to a particular group. The difference that many of us have noted with the crack cone cocaine epidemic and the opioid crisis of today is that the crack cocaine epidemic had affected uh, Black Americans, whereas today we're seeing a lot of the opioid uh, epidemic affect a lot of white Americans. So our training does teach us that certain things do happen more in one group than the other. And so we may use race, age, or region, and sometimes these are buzzwords on our exams. However, we have to ask ourselves, at times, if race is sometimes a necessary identifier in some of these discussions and some of these questions, and sometimes when we're on rounds and we're presenting our patients.
And historically, Dana Bowen Matthew had told us that in her book, Just Medicine, that there were laws that were in place that ensured unequal treatment. And they may have gone away, but their structural framework are still with us today. And structural violence, as said by Dr. Johan Goltung, uh, is something that is a social arrangement and it puts individuals in harm's way. And it's structural because it's embedded in just about everything we do. Uh, the political, economic, and the social world, it's everywhere. Uh, but it's violent because it hurts people. And so you may not see it in your daily interaction, but it definitely exists. And I think this is something that many of us uh, had come to terms with in the past few years. And so this shows how implicit bias and structural racism work hand in hand. If you look in the top right corner, you'll see voting rights, FHA loans, and residential segregation, access to education and green spaces, jobs and hiring and advancement. So if there are policies that are in place that do not allow you to vote, that do not allow you to get home loans, um, i.e., as you could see with redlining, uh, residential segregation, as you can also see with redlining, or access to education or a good education, even having trees in your neighborhood and resources and access to positions, and even access to jobs, but also being paid equally online with others. If there are policies in place that keep these things unequal, then you're going to see at the bottom here inequitable outcomes in racial disparities. So if you begin over time to see that you see a certain group associated with these inequitable outcomes, then in print and on TV and in media, there will be associations that will be made with said group. And then it will, it will help others who may, you know, grow up seeing this uh, support keeping things a little either separate or maybe thinking that these people, uh, this is inherently a part of who they are. And so certain policies should not necessarily change. And so this is that cycle that many of us who may not even understand some of the policies that are in play that are keeping um, health disparities uh, presenting to us at bedside. And so there are political determinants of health. And these involve policies and political structures that create the foundation for social determinants of health. We talk about social determinants of health all of the time. Well, political determinants of health decide the power and resources that are distributed to all of us. And that can determine whether we have health access, health access or not, whether we have health equity or not. And so these are some of them. And I know, you know, you've discussed this many times. You've thought about it. It may have been brought up on rounds or in clinic or even in a grand round. But I just want to, you know, make sure that you see some of these. Employment, uh, hunger, access to healthy options, having a playground, transportation, walkability in your neighborhood, under healthcare, uh, provider availability, provider linguistic and cultural competency, the quality of that care social integration, and even if you have a support system to give you a ride to the clinic, right? Um, and community engagement. And whether or not you're facing discrimination, these all can affect your health. And this is something that I put together from something that I've been working on, which is looking at the history of racism and public and health policies. And I just end up noticing that structural racism is a part of a lot of things that uh, uh, affect the health disparities um, that we uh, see at bedside. So in the left here, you see the political determinants of health um, that help uh, build the foundation for the health policies and the public policies that affect us today. And structural racism is affecting all of this. And it's also cyclical in a sense. And then social determinants of health um, come out of this, but they help to determine the health inequities that we see in our community and then the health disparities of those patients that we see at bedside. And some of the health and public policies that I've studied uh, to create this framework um, are the slave uh, health subsystem, meaning that, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but there were uh, hospitals and clinics on plantations, um, et cetera. Um, the civil, post-Civil War, the Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau, Black Codes, Jim Crow Laws, uh, the Black Midwives and Shepherd Town and Maternity and Infancy Protection Act, um, which has actually created the CFA that we know of today, um, which is, um, 
an organization that's under the uh, Department of Health and Human Services today. Um, the New Deal, which we just spoke about, which created the projects uh, such as Iberville that has that low um, uh, life expectancy. Um, the Hilburton Act, which we'll get into, Civil Rights Act, even Medicare and Medicaid has been affected as we talked about, as some people uh, decide whether or not Medicaid should be expanded. Um, Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 86, and in the Violent Crime Law, which was called Three Strikes Sure Out in 1994, and even the Affordable Care Act has been affected through the lens of race. We are concerned about the constant use of federal funds to support this most notorious expression of segregation. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. I see no alternative to direct action and creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of a nation. Dr. Martin Luther King in 1966, who's speaking to a medical committee on us. So let's take a look at the history of structural violence and medical racism. So plant, plantation life was a complete misnomer because it wasn't a, a, a great or it wasn't a life much at all. Um, and so to be enslaved was to endure a violent existence. Human beings became a commodity and their health was merely a concern for production um, of labor and reproduction of workers, meaning women were raped or forced to mate with uh, other ens enslaved men to create children as workers. Some women were required um, as early as they could have menses to produce up to 14 children. These human beings were called slaves. Um, and when I dress them, I dress them as enslaved humans or enslaved uh, people, not necessarily just slaves because it was used in a sense to devalue them um, uh, as human beings. And these men, women, and children suffered infections. They were malnourished, they were beaten, they were raped, they had, they had STIs. Um, were uh, slave hospitals uh, that were on these plantations and sometimes just outside um, to help keep them alive for production um, and also to get them ready um, for the auction block, which New Year's Day was usually the day when families went up on an auction block and were separated. And experimentation occurred um, on many and many of these slave hospitals. The Freedmen's Bureau um, was formed after the Civil War, which then um, led to the Emancipation Proclamation and ended slavery as we knew it. And so with many uh, free Black Americans, they were trying to, to get out of the South as many as could um, for those who knew that they were no longer enslaved. Obviously, Juneteenth lets you know that a couple of years later, many people did not still did not know that they were free and found out later. But for those who did know, uh, flocked to U.S. cities um, further up north or two cities in our south. And the concern was tuberculosis because there was a concern that so many of these uh, newly freed uh, Black Americans, not considered Black Americans at that time, but Black Americans um, would bring tuberculosis to uh, white counterparts. And so there was a decision that there should be, and we'll get into it, hospitals, et cetera. The Freedmen's Bureau was created because many of these men, African-American men, fought in the Civil War in order to ensure uh, a win uh, for our country against uh, those who um, were a part of the Confederacy. And they were uh, not supported in any way after. So at that time, the goal was to make sure that they could have access to health care, education, and a way to build community. And so many iterations occurred, um, a few vetoes. However, there was some funding that did occur in 1866, and it ended in 1869. Under the Freedmen's Bureau, there was a medical division. The funds were a bit insufficient. Um, however, it was created. Hospitals, dispensaries, and home visits were available. And in those four years, more than 90 hospitals and medical facilities were created. And I'm not speaking of the ones that look like the Grady you see today or your hospital. These were small in-home hospitals that could have uh, been sponsored by a physician or a church, et cetera. 
upwards of 563,000 patients were treated, uh, but in many of these cities, there were unsanitary conditions, lack of funding, malnutrition um, to fund this, you know, to fund this effort. And there were inexperienced and unqualified doctors as well. And speaking of that, um, at this time, there were many medical schools that uh, were built around this time. And some of these uh, historically black colleges created medical schools. Many historically black colleges, or quite a few of them, were funded by the Freedmen's Bureau, such as the Freedmen's Hospital under Howard University and uh, alike. Some of these other uh, medical schools may have just been built that were not or created that were not connected to a university. And so I just want to point out here that uh, in the late 19th century, there were more than 10 Black medical schools. Um, and there are two that out of, out of these that exist today, and that's Howard University and Meharry Medical College at the top. I just want to point out that Leonard Medical School was the first four-year medical school in the U.S. of any medical school, and they trained 400 African Americans. Due to issues with continuing to have funding, um, sustaining funding, that school closed. If anyone is um, familiar with Abraham Flexner, he wrote the Flexner Report on Medical Education. I'll get to it. So... He was not a physician, but he was hired by Carnegie and others to assess medical schools, mainly in the U.S., because there were a lot of proprietary for-profit medical schools, um, and it wasn't, you know, just Black. It was white. Um, there were some for women as well, and so he was tasked with taking a look at these medical schools and making a recommendation on the ones that should survive and just, just the framework for medical schools, um, and it affects the, the way that we're trained today. So, he visited 155 medical schools. He recommended that 89 be closed. And he recommended also that there be four-year medical schools as the standard and they always be connected to universities. He recommended that all for-profit medical schools be closed and the two plus two model be classroom and clinical. So there were seven black medical schools at this time and he recommended that five out of the seven be closed. And then the two remaining, as we noted, were Howard and Meharry. This is about page 81, if you were to pull up the Flexner Report online. And so there was not a whole lot of benevolence in this approach. His key issue was, you know, I don't necessarily prefer to be a bunch of Black doctors, but we need some because, you know, we don't want uh, the Negroes to be sick and infect uh, white Americans. So we do need some Black doctors. Uh, just to be, you know, educated for the sake of uh, quelling or treating uh, infection within this population so that it does not spread. The Flexner Report exacerbated systemic racism in medicine since at that time, many of the remaining medical schools would not train Black physicians due to racist admissions. So, you know, at, before he started, there were 12, it went to 10, and then there were seven. And so he recommended that five be closed. There were two that were remaining. Um, and not all the ones that were closed were proprietary. Uh, many or a few or more were actually connected to universities. The issue is that once you closed many of them and there were just two left, many schools did not want to bring up to African Americans. Case in point, Emory University, where I work. And so in 1959, August 5th, um, Dr. Marion Gerald Hood was once a student, um, undergrad student, who applied to the School of Medicine at Emory, and many have seen this letter um, around the internet. Basically, it notes that, you know, you might even be great. However, uh, we cannot admit you because you are a member of the Negro race. We can't help. So sorry. Here's your refund. And so um, Dr. Marion Hood uh, has practiced obst obstetrics and gynecology for the past, I think, 30 years at this point. Um, and so Emory has given a formal apology to him uh, last year. And in that, he noted that, I know that this circulates all over uh, the world, this letter here, but this is not the, the this is not my legacy. Um, I, you know, continue to practice, I continue to care for patients, I continue to be a part of a community, but, you know, 
as this letter circulates, because he, he understands that it will not stop circulating. Um, and that is fair because this is the ev evidence of, you know, our very recent past. He notes that we need to find a way to push forward and make sure that there is equal access um, to students of every background, of every race and background, ethnicity, um, to uh, have access to apply to medical school and become physicians. And uh, we definitely appreciated that, but they definitely definitely wanted to reconcile with him and uh, give a formal apology. So we have four Black medical schools, historically Black college and university medical schools. So that's Meharry, Howard, Charles Drew in Los Angeles, and Morehouse School of Medicine uh, in Georgia. However, we're still about 5% of the physicians who practice in the U.S. And so let's talk a bit about the Black physician and how many were early leaders in health equity in the hospital. So the NMA, many of you may know about the National Medical Association, was originally the National Negro Medical Association, founded in 1895. And the reason was that the American Medical Association did not allow Black physicians to join. The key thing about these societies, which many of us you know, don't have to worry about today, is that in order to gain privileges at a hospital, usually you had to be a part of a powerful society and have someone vouch for you so that you would be able to gain uh, privileges to work at a hospital. Um, also, those connections could also help you um, to have a license if needed um, to practice in uh, a state. The idea of state licensures is very interesting too and has a history as well. Um, but the key thing is that with segregation, societies were not allowing persons of color and specifically in this case, many black physicians were trying to gain entry but also could not gain entry to practice in these hospitals. As you can see in this picture, people of all backgrounds, uh, races and backgrounds were fighting for the right to integrate all county and state medical societies. The Black hospital movement was very important. So we talked about, um, you know, uh, well, we didn't say necessarily 13th Amendment, but we talked about um, the ending of slavery and we talked about uh, reconstruction and we talked about the Freedmen's Bureau. Well, as I pointed out, many hospitals were built after that with a little bit of government funding. Some survived, some did not. What many were finding is that as we were having, you know, medical schools that were created late 19th century, early early 20th century, they were producing black doctors, but they uh, didn't really have a hospital where they could practice. So there were physicians like Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who was the first surgeon to successfully perform open heart surgery, um, created hospitals such as Provident Hospital in Chicago in 1891. And so the whole point of all this is that Black nurses and Black physicians, Black dentists were not able to practice or train in white hospitals and address health uh, disparities of Black folks. So you had many hospitals that were popping up around the country, but they were um, tasked with not allowing uh, Black patients to be treated. Black physicians could not be trained. And so this contributed to the low life expectancy of many Black Americans around this time. So they wanted to do something about it. The problem is with many of these hospitals that were also seeking government funding to help keep, to help keep them going, um, they were underfunded, not funded, et cetera. And many of this was with intention. And so you had many black hospitals that may have started out strong, uh, but then did not continue to um, press forward as a strong uh, hospital that could provide the care needed for black patients. And so many at this point, um, the National Medical Association, the National Hospital Association, the NAACP considered it the Negro medical ghetto because this was really separate and unequal. And so many of these protests continued and many wanted to integrate hospitals. And so the Hill Burden Act, which I spoke of when I looked at um, health policies of the past, um, this was the Hospital Survey and Construction Act. It was the largest investor in hospitals in our history and rebuilt our hospital system nationwide. And the key here is that even though it created 700,000 beds um, from 1946 to 1963, um, and it, it continues today with um, 
um, some edits there. We'll talk about that. But at that point, the creation of 700,000 beds is huge um, in, in one country, right? The key was that these hospitals that received this funding had to uphold Plessy versus Ferguson, which was to create separate and so-called equal care. So it had to be segregated care if you were to receive government funding. So many of these hospitals sought to you know, meet this requirement. And we'll talk more about it because Grady, where I work, was one of them. We had a separate ER, um, a separate ambulance system, and even a separate entrance, which I can still see evidence of today because I work which is a uh, 10 C and D, which is like used to be the black wing, which is C and D throughout the hospital is the back of the hospital and A and B is the front of the hospital. So in 1910 in Atlanta, we had a lot of problems with the sewer lines that were dumped into black communities. And so there was high morbidity and mortality. Many people were just basically sick. And so the idea was just that it was the uncleanliness of the black residents, not poor city planning. So many were sick. And so I couldn't put anybody in Grady Hospital. Because of segregation, I couldn't even visit there as a doctor. You lost your patient at the front door, said Dr. Homer Nash, a Black physician in 1910. Grady, Grady uh, um, in the late 1800s, Emory was a partner in 1915. We provided at that time segregated, segregated care um, which was separate and unequal. Many of my patients today still call Grady the Grady's because obviously um, it was desegregated uh, 64, 65, fully around that time, around 65. And so many of my patients, um, because things are slow moving, um, still noted that um, they were alive, my, my elderly patients, when it was called the Grady's. And so they still call it the Grady's. Black physicians were not allowed to work there. And Black wards were C and D, as I told you, which is where I work now, um, my office. And then uh, white wings were A and B. Now the hospital is fully integrated. Um, a and B faces the front of the hospital. What's interesting is that we, uh, where the C and D wings are, we have a lot of clinics or um, offices that are on those sides because it's, because it's become very hard, which they're still working on to convert those to inpatient wings, but because of um, just the way that that side was created, it is very difficult to convert those versus the A and B side to this day, but we are obviously working on it. We need the space. Um, so Black physicians without privileges did exist at this time. And so what would happen is that the Black physician will call a white physician and confirm that a patient definitely needed admission to Grady. They were quite ill. And that white physician um, would get the sign out, agree to the patient being admitted. The patient would be admitted under that name, uh, that physician's name. And then the Black physician could no longer care and or check up on that patient. And they could not um, follow the progress per se. And many Black physicians found this to be humiliating because Black patients then um, would not necessarily trust them or um, maybe see the white physician's um, you know, word or their idea of what their clinical care should be is more important than what the Black physician had thought. And so when that patient was discharged, sometimes it was hard to regain that relationship. Uh, black nurses were allowed to work on the CND wings. And outpatient clinics were very interesting because Black patients would, might have to travel far to get to the hospital. And so basically, they waited in clinic until all the white patients were seen and examined. And then they would go to the back examination rooms. And then they would then be examined at the end of the day and given whatever recommendations. And so this was very difficult. They also received their meds in segregated pharmacy, which is like our senior care straight down um, on the ground floor. And so Grady Memorial um, had an um, you know, early care for uh, Black indigent patients. We also had Black ambulances. And so there were Black ambulances, white ambulances. And what you would do is you would call um, and, and request uh, an ambulance. You would give your race, and then they would decide you know, which ambulance would come to you. Uh, there were more, and this is the structural issue, right? So it's already unequal in that it has to be segregated. Then there were more white ambulances than there were black ambulances. Uh, and so if all the black ambulances uh, were already occupied, 
and there were white ambulances available, that Black patient would still have to wait for a Black ambulance. Obviously, uh, there were mortalities that occurred due to this. You can't take a human being and teach them that another human being is a second-rate human being and expect them to respond as rapidly as he's going to respond to the first-rate human being. I'm calling it a timing factor. The staff responded a few minutes later with the Black patient, and that response will probably continue with the entire treatment. The words of Dr. Asa Yancey, uh, an interview about segregated hospitals. And so Dr. Asa Yancey um, was named chief of surgery in 1958 and was promised uh, the chance to train uh, surgical residents, Black surgical residents, at a non-indigent hospital called Hugh Spaulding. Hugh Spaulding um, was a hospital that was uh, in partnership created, um, to, again, to serve non-indigent Black patients, but would have uh, Black uh, trainees uh, not necessarily med students, but at least residents who would care for these patients and also follow up with them at outpatient clinic. This did not work out. They did not receive the funding they were supposed to. And so because of that, um, the hospital closed and now it is a children hos children's hospital um, that is on the same campus. Issues like this became the problem of the day. And so in Sim Simpkins v. Uh, Moses H. Cone Memorial Hospital, which was in North Carolina, uh, black physicians, dentists, and patients sued and said, you know, this whole idea of separate but equal um, uh, treatment and staff privileges, et cetera, should not exist. Uh, this is hurting us as physicians and it's hurting our patients. And so, well, um, it was noted that the Hill Burton Act was unconstitutional. Um, which was great. However, hospitals that did not receive government funding said, we don't have to listen to you. We uh, don't necessarily receive your funding. And so a court decision in Eaton versus Grubbs noted that, yeah, you can't do this either. Um, we're going to have to uh, desegregate all hospital systems uh, in our country. So are we still living into America since segregation has ended, but the disparity still exists? There are a few things that are going on. Lack of home ownership, the decreased life expectancy, I keep speaking about, acute illnesses, multiple comorbidities, lack of insur insurance, un unemployment and underemployment um, still affect many. So let's look at a little bit of history from Tulsa to Tuskegee and beyond. There were many Black massacres that happened in our history, um, and many of these are swept under the rug, ignored, um, history, you know, has been sanitized quite some time. Uh, but racial violence is a symptom of structural violence because many have moved on with impunity. And so Tulsa, the Tulsa massacre, as many of you may have heard of, um, began May uh, 31st, 1921 and ended June 1st, 1921. And 300 Americans were murdered, 10,000 people were displaced, many people's homes were reduced to rubble. But this area, which many call, as you see in this picture, they called it Little Africa, some called it Black Wall Street. Uh, there were dentist office, physician's offices, law offices, movie theaters, hotels, et cetera, um, all burnt down um, due to mob violence. And many were displaced and tried to return, um, but that did not work out. And what many have pointed out was that a century after the Tulsa massacre, what you see is that there's still uh, uh, inequities in the medical infrastructure that drive the health gap in the same neighborhood. And many have called it out. There is a legacy of po poverty also in, in, in many communities. And one of them is the black community, as you can see here at the blue line at the bottom. And this can affect one's health. And so there's an endless cycle um, where underfunded schools can lead to a weak educational system. We have school funding that's based on property tax. And what's interesting is, you know, when you look at gentrification, you can see a neighborhood that has been um, predominantly predominantly Latinx or predominantly Black, uh, where the, the property tax is quite low because the valuation of that particular neighborhood is considered low. But once it becomes gentrified and you have others move in, then the property value of those homes skyrocket. With the property value of those homes skyrocket, any of you who have looked at, you know, your property tax that, that you pay, uh, you'll see how much goes to school systems. 
And so the value of a neighborhood can really help predetermine how much funding goes to that said school system. When a, when a neighborhood is underfunded, um, undervalued, excuse me, that school system is also. And you might say, well, if these are rundown neighborhoods that are not necessarily uh, invested in or cared for, that's a whole other discussion. And the reason why I say that is you'll find at times where people who still you know, pay taxes in a particular neighborhood, they might have garbage trucks that come less to that neighborhood, et cetera. But also um, there's a neighborhood here uh, in Cascade uh, where uh, it's a predominantly black neighborhood. Many black physicians and lawyers say live in that neighborhood. The homes were worth 200,000 some time ago. Um, the property value has never climbed. The neighborhoods are just clean and beautiful, but the, the value of those neighborhoods have never climbed. And there actually have been um, articles written about this. Um, and then when you find in neighborhoods like this where gentrification happens, the value of the homes double. Um, and so uh, other issues are um, lack of technical job skills and professional education um, that are offered. And many unionized jobs that many of our grandparents uh, and parents may have um, uh, had the access to, many Blacks were kept out of that bargaining for fair pay and health insurance. And many Black women and Black men are underpaid. So you may say, okay, well, you have that job, but if you're underpaid by almost nearly 50 percent, then you're having to work a bit harder to, you know, produce the same amount of money. And over-policed neighborhoods um, such as Stop, Stop and Frisk create a school-to-prison pipeline. So you might say, well, if you control for education, um, I have the same level of education as a white male, I still may earn less uh, as 60 cents on a dollar. And with incarceration, there's been an increase in, car in incarceration. And for many, because of the cash bail system, you'll see many who make it picked up, say, for stop and frisk, which is supposed to be illegal, but it still happens. And so they're entered into said system. And, you know, because of cash bail, systems and issues like that, they've not been released. People lose their jobs that way. When you fill out, you know, a, a form, you know, on, you know, to apply for a job and they ask you, you have any, you know, history concerning incarceration that can pre prevent you from having a job, which can also prevent you um, from having access to health care. And this is noted by Michelle Alexander as well. And when you talk about homes, as I pointed out to you, um, you might say, well, you know, uh, the American dream is to own a home. You can, you know, purchase that property, watch it increase in value. You can borrow against it. You can put your kids through college. You can sell that home, et cetera. But what's being noted here is that appraisers uh, can very easily go into a home. And if they see, as noted in this article, where there's a Black couple um, they go into the home and may see articles in the home that uh, show that there's a black family versus a white family. The home will be undervalued. Many couples recently have decided to have uh, their friends who are white come into the home, host that appraiser, take things down in the home that would be identifying as maybe a black household. And in this case, saw their home value increase by 500,000. This is actually not uncommon. So generational wealth is being denied. Redlining, this is Baltimore, where I'm from. And so this is the area, um, you know, the home uh, home loan corporation under the New Deal uh, had decided that this particular area in red, you know, please don't give them more, uh, a mortgage. Uh, please don't help fund uh, any American dreams in this particular area. And so what you found was um, a lot of impoverished folks in that, and there's a whole, there's a whole, there's much to say about this because there's a whole system that follows this, which is people who then try to purchase homes um, of the prior owners, maybe from like the early 1900s in these in these in this area, were full of lead, as many still are today, um, are full of lead, um, were had old piping, et cetera, and were very unhealthy to live in. And then the, the women or the men who did purchase these homes, the homes were not worth what the mortgage obviously was. And what you would find is that there was consistent um, undervaluing of these homes, whereas it became to a point where many um, would then leave, and then they could purchase uh, purchase these properties um, in large amounts. 
um, and then begin to turn the neighborhoods around for profit. And this is a cycle um, uh, that, that has been noted uh, in, in quite a few writings. But the key here is that with redlining is that you're not able to buy into the American dream and pass wealth down to your family. And this was a decision by our government that still affects us today. Environmental racism, again, is nothing new. And many of our patients who present to bedside who have asthma and COPD, other issues are living in these types of neighborhoods. And what you're finding is that for African-Americans who may make, um, who may be middle-class, they still have a lot of times more pollution in their urban neighborhoods than you would find in maybe poor white neighborhoods. And then, you know, the gloves are off in rural neighborhoods, black, white, et cetera. You're finding that a lot of our patients are ill because of environmental, um, not just racism, but um, just malfeasance. And so many have filed claims with the EPA, but what you'll see with these people of color is that um, they've been denied. And if anyone knows about the Mississippi water crisis, it's happening now. And so poverty is a risk factor for becoming unwell. And we just talked about when someone is middle-class and African-American, you still have a higher risk, even for some poor white people who have annual incomes of 10,000. But you know, there's also environmental racism concerning not just the food desert and lack of fresh grocery stores, but food swamps. Um, I tend to call these heart attack row. Um, there's just there's, there's been documented nowhere. It's just my opinion in that you'll find fast food restaurant but followed by another fast food restaurant followed by an alcohol store. And then you'll find a dialysis center uh, all on the same street. And so these are decisions that are being made um, these are political determinants of health that decide what's available in said neighborhood. And they also don't have green spaces and exercise facilities. And also we do have that history of rate, medical racism and neglect, which you know uh, also had learned uh, led to uh, experimentation and research without informed consent. And so you have the neighborhood that you've grown up in. Um, not feeling valued in your neighborhood. And when you go to the medical system that is supposed to care for you, you may not feel seen. Um, and there is a history of um, experimentation and, and lack of consent. And so Black people uh, have been subject to inferior healthcare access and delivery, and we have consequently experienced well, worse health outcomes since the inception of slavery in the American colony, said Dr. Miller. And some of the other injustices in medicine Dr. J. Mary Sims, many of us know about surgical experimentation upon Black women, the Eugenics Board of North Carolina, Henrietta Lacks cancer cells, um, which for which our family has still not received anything um, for their use, and the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, which is sponsored by our government. Other things. Serena Williams, many of us know who she is. Um, she, and many of you may know the story, has history of VTE. So, you know, she had a few PEs and DVTs in her past and she um, was pregnant, had an emergency C-section and obviously they had to stop her anticoagula anticoagulation. In that, um, you know, she was in bed, her mother was at bedside. I think her baby was in the nursery. She felt short of breath. She did not want to alarm her mother, got up and went to the nurse's station and told them that she was short of breath, did not feel very well and thought she might've had another PE. They told her that um, she was just nervous, not necessarily true. Um, she kept pushing. She would not leave the desk until they called her physician. All she asked was for them to just call her physician. They did not. Um, and after continuing to push, they called her physician. He did uh, order a CT to evaluate for pulmonary embolism, pulmonary emboli, because I think she had more than one. And she did. She was started on a heparin drip and she's with us today. But it took a while for them to believe her. If it takes that much for someone to believe Serena Williams at her complaint just to ask for it to be investigated, can you imagine? And so we must reconcile with the history of harm. Many daily interactions with implicit bias do exist in Black patients. It doesn't just come from a history of talking about Tuskegee and other things. It's daily interactions. And this article here notes that racial bias and pain assessment, part of that study was done at Emory um, at this time in 2016. And the thought was that Black people's skin were a little bit thicker than white people's skin, so we didn't feel as much pain. So we must acknowledge that our patients' fears are valid and understand that this did affect us in the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And if we place racialized medicine under the microscope and ask ourselves, are we coded for bias? We could look at our history and see that um, when PFTs are performed every day, there is a, a, a measurement um, that creates normalcy by race. Um, and we'll get into that. And so if we ask ourselves that we code it for bias, race is a social construct. It's not biological. Um, and it's been a dominating identifier in medicine. So why are we still doing that? There's race correction in the x-ray machine in, the, in our history, where there were increased radiation doses given to Black Americans. I think the thought was that our skull is thicker, our bones were thicker. Anyway, but yes, right? Um, moving on for PFTs, um, and this is something that um, you can definitely, definitely look into, but there was a discussion around how the PFTs uh, were created, and it's actually documented, it's not just discussion. PFTs were created to show that Black people had poor lung capacity, et cetera, and working in the fields would help improve that. And so um, that's the basis for what happened with PFTs. And so there's a correction for race currently today. And so there is a discussion around the country to remove that from pulmonary function tests. There have been discussions about the pulse ox and not being able to pick up um, uh, O2 sets in darker skin. And so I, you could see how this could affect what happens within COVID when many people, the decision whether or not to admit was based off of whether or not their O2 sets were low enough. There are negative descriptors of racial bias in the health record. And so this study found that Black patients were 2.5 times more likely to have a negative descriptor. EGFR the same. And even race norming for CTE, Black male, um, football players had to show that they had more severe cogn cognitive decline than white players. And even with admi admissions to the cardiology floor for heart failure. So the question is, do we need black doctors? We do, um, but the question also is how do we get there? And the way to do that um, is to not just create the pipeline, but also make it a place where Black faculty will want to stay, will want to train. Um, look at the school systems that we talked about um, and try to create a path to medicine, um, not only you know, within high schools and colleges, but even starting with the elementary schools. We need to take a look at our framework within our country. We're still at 5%. And if you were to control um, for the 5%, if you were to look at the history of the, the medical schools that have been closed, we would have 35,000 more doctors today. But we need to look at retention as well. The, our residents, we need to make them feel welcome, right? So they may want to stay behind or stay with us and, and teach. And this is a 35,000 more doctors we would have today if those medical schools had not closed. We do deal with microaggressions. And, and, and that is not necessarily okay. We need to, we need to look at that to reevaluate how we um, work to retain um, faculty and residents as well as med students. And lastly, I'll just say, what did we learn on rounds? All of these things. We saw all of this on rounds within our patients. Um, these are the things that you may not think when you're speaking with the patient, but they present themselves. And after the murder of George Floyd, we have to ask ourselves, can health justice and advocacy start at bedside for our patients? Um, does it start there? It can. Um, once they're admitted or they're in the ER, it can start there. So we must identify, reimagine, partner, and do the work. And in closing, I won't go through all of these, but I'll just say, identify some of the biases and structural racism in your primary care practice, in your hospital, um, in the communities, and identify with your patients when they're telling you they're going through these things. Reimagine what you're looking at concerning the way hospitals address social determinants of health, health equity, um, and the way that people have access to learn how to become a doctor, right? Look at these things, reimagine them. It's, it's on us to do the work. 
and then partner with each other as we're doing right now. But also, if you have time, volunteer at a high school, volunteer, speak to a group of high school students or college students, um, a kindergarten class even, but also partner with the public health sector, help people to see that careers in healthcare are important. Um, also look at ways that you can listen to your patients at bedside. The best advocacy starts with the patient right in front of you and give them respect, validate their fears and understand that there is a medical a history of medical racism in this country. And they understand that, but the way that it is verified with them many times is their interaction with us. And it doesn't matter your race because they see a position of power, even if you are a black physician, right? You may represent the institution that they're afraid of. So validate that, validate them, make them feel welcome. And that's the best advocacy you can start with. And so let's get to work. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Jala. Unfortunately, we're a little over time, so we don't Sorry have about time that. for questions. No, it was it was perfect. Dr. Risk, amazing talk. Dr. Jala, I always learned so much from you, both disturbing and enlightening. Very grateful. I completely, completely agree. <laughs> Dr. Jala, thank you for an hour of having us sit back and reflect and, as you said, reimagine, which I think is so, so important for all of us in this incredible but also scary field based on all the things that you brought up. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you to everyone in the audience and on Zoom um, for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I will place my email um, in the chat for any questions. And again, so sorry that I know we started a little after time, but sorry that I ran. Over. That was my fault. Thank you so much, Dr. Adal. It was perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Great talk, Kalisha. Yes, thank you. Good to see you. Bye. <laughs>